Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you all for continuing in your, uh, with us, uh, participating with us in our study through 1 Corinthians. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to feast upon your word as we await your return. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We're so aware of our limitations, and we are so thankful that we have you as our one teacher, our comforter, and our teacher. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, and last time we finished chapter 8, and so we now begin chapter 9. And immediately we have one of the rather common problems in the scriptures. We get the idea that the chapter division has changed the subject, and it hasn't. And the Holy Spirit has Paul dealing with individual and, and personal problems in the fellowship things we need to know is how the Lord would have us conduct our lives, especially in as it concerns our relationships with one another. Since we are brothers and sisters in Christ, one body, uh, there's a unity, and you remember that we were exhorted to be careful uh, to take heed, lest by any means this liberty of ours, uh, verse 9, chapter 8, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if a man see you who have knowledge sit at the idol's temple, and now turn over to uh, the 10th chapter, the 28th verse, uh, but if any man say to you that this is in sacrifice to idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. So you see we're still on the same subject and, and don't let the chapter division divert you away from the fact that we're looking at Christian liberty and our relationship to brothers and sisters in Christ. And what we have seen and what we will see developed is that the limit of our liberty is not law but conscience. Conscience is a gift from God himself and it is something inside each one of us who are new creations in Christ uh, and that that seems to caution us one way or another but everybody's conscience is not the same and it's interesting that the Holy Spirit himself says that there are those with a weak conscience and those with a strong conscience well that shouldn't really be all that surprising even on a human level, there are babes who have a long ways to go before that they, they can talk or walk. And, uh, you know, God has a family. And there we are all at different stages of development and growth. There are some who are highly developed, you know, college professors and all of those in between. And there are weak consciences and there are strong consciences. What I find interesting is, you know, it's very interesting that the Holy Spirit says that the strong conscience is the one that, that doesn't have, any, uh, have near as many inhibitions as the weak conscience. Therefore, uh, one would think that maybe what we ought to do is spend our time strengthening the consciences of those who are weak or trying to boost their faith uh, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and that isn't what we're seeing. That isn't what we found. And our chapter ended. If, if food, if meat makes my brother to, to offend, I will eat no meat, no flesh, while the world stands, unless I make, lest I make my brother stumble. So is not Paul free? He asks four questions. Am I not an apostle? Paul's writing that, but the Holy Spirit is saying that. Paul, Paul said, I praise God that you received the word from us as it was indeed the word of God. This is not Paul's word. 
not his reasoning, not his logic. This is God's Word. You, know, you can listen to sermon after sermon, and it's Paul, 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 Paul. And I'm trying to tell you that it's Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. This is God's Word. Am I not an apostle? Now, why does he say that? He said, if meat makes my brother to offend, I'll never eat it. Not while the world stands will I eat it. Because I don't want to offend a dear brother, a dear precious brother in Christ. Well, that's silly. I mean, aren't you free? Am I not an apostle? He says, am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? It's very interesting since it's God doing the speaking here. We are His work, not one another's work. I don't suppose that there's a study I know of. In, in fact, even the articles I read that people don't immediately turn to the first chapter of Acts. Uh, am I not an apostle? What, what is an apostle? Well, you know, Judas... He met all of those requirements for an apostle in Acts except the resurrection of Christ. He kind of missed that. Uh, interesting, at least in his flesh, he did not see the resurrected Lord, but he was an apostle. I'd be surprised, uh, tremendously surprised, if he didn't perform miracles. I'd be surprised if he weren't one of those who distributed the bread and the fish, feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000. I'd be surprised if he wasn't sent out as one of the apostles when the Lord sent them out. No text at all says that he distinguished against Judas or, or uh, anything like that. That's astounding. Christ knew all the time about Judas. I've chosen you and one of you is a devil. You know, it was never hid from the Lord. Why did he put up with Judas? Believe me, if I had 12 people working for me and I knew one of them was a devil, I mean, he's the last one in the world that I'd make treasurer of my company, but that was Judas. And, of course, he fell. And the, disi the disciples, they got together and they decided that they needed somebody to take over the apostleship of Judas. And I'm willing to agree with most uh, uh, theological institutions that that was a special uh, a special time it was a special apostleship and they set down certain requirements and I believe it to be God's word you know you could say that they came up with with uh, these requirements but I'm still persuaded that I only read what God gave I realize there are things in this book uh, that, you know, well, I mean, look, God spoke these things. He, he said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Well, the truth is that somebody said that. It isn't that God was lying. What is true is, is that God said it. What God said is to show us how foolish it was. So they said, we have to have somebody who has accompanied us, who's worked with us in every detail from the baptism of John to the resurrection of Christ, have I not seen Jesus Christ? So there's something special about one who has accompanied him from the baptism of John to his resurrection from the dead. Did Paul do that? Well, I don't know. I don't. Most theologians I've talked to say absolutely he did that. He was around at the baptism of John. Well, if he was persecuting Christians, I can't imagine the difficulty he might have uh, uh, given John. But we don't have any history of that. We don't know that. When did Paul see Jesus Christ? When did he see Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus? I don't think he ever... I don't think Paul ever had any idea who Jesus Christ was before he met him on the road to Damascus. So his argument here is, even if I'm not an apostle unto others, 
and and I can't help but think that that when uh, uh, Matthias joined the group that the 12 of them thought Paul was really an apostle. I don't know. I don't want to read more white spaces there than I should. I don't want to be accused of making God's Word say more than it says. My big problem is, is in finding out uh, enough of what it does say. He asked the question, am I not an apostle? And the question is, is phrased in the language that anticipates a positive answer. Yes. Yes. Am I not free? Well, yes. If, if I'm free, why would I refrain from eating meat as long as the world stands? Am I not free? Can I eat all the meat I want? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I just told you, the Holy Spirit says through Paul that I won't do that if it causes my brother to stumble. Now, folks, I'm trying desperately to separate your minds from Paul's ideas to God's ideas. Look at verse 17. If I do this willingly, I have my, a reward. But if against my will, a responsibility of the gospel is committed unto me. So it isn't Paul's will we're looking at in this chapter. We're looking at that which was committed to him. And that's God's word through Paul. You know, I've, argue, I've argued with seminary professors, well, after all, uh, the Holy Spirit in inspiration does use the individual characteristics of the writer. And I say, wait a minute, God gave us all of those individual characteristics. I stubbornly re refused to depart from the conviction that God separated Paul from his mother's womb. And everything that ever touched his life, and this is the same is true with you and, and me, everything that ever touched Paul's life was designed by the sovereign God to fit Paul for the job of completing the Word of God. So you can say, well, Paul's individual characteristics show through. He doesn't have any individual characteristics. He has those characteristics that God engineered in him from his birth until he was called on the, on the Damascus Road to complete the Scriptures. It's, uh, it's interesting that Paul writes that he was to complete the Word of God. Well, is he boasting? No, he's writing what God said. So God is saying through Paul, Paul's an apostle. He's absolutely free. He, has he not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? He didn't consider that Christ was Lord until he was struck down on the road to Damascus, but Jesus Christ was his Lord from before he was born. He was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now he knows who the Lord is. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And I believe he's referring to a resurrection appearance, not seeing him sometime in his earthly ministry. And then the Holy Spirit says, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit saying, are not you, are, are you not my work in the Lord? If, I'm, if I am not an apostle unto others, doubtless I am to you for the, for the seal, the certainty, the evidence of my apostleship are you in the Lord. How many, how many verses of Scripture, folks, do we need to tell us that no man can believe but by the Holy Spirit? You know, I don't care who Paul is, the greatest writer of Scripture in the world or the poorest or the most brilliant man that ever lived or the dumbest, no matter what he is, nobody could come to know Jesus Christ in a personal relationship separate from the Holy Spirit. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to be called the sons of God. And everybody stops reading right there. Who were born, who were born, 
Okay? Didn't even finish a sentence. Not of their will, nor of the will of any man, nor of the will of the flesh, but by the will of God. That's how they were born. You know, Nicodemus, you're confused. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. No man can come unto me except my Father who is in heaven, not Paul, okay, the apostle. No one, unless my Father forces him, drags him. We have scripture after scripture. When the Comforter come, will, is come, he will, whom I will send from the Father, the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He will testify of me. So the only way they are the evidence of his apostleship is that the Holy Spirit worked through him to lead them to Christ. And the Jews, folks, did really did not consider Paul to be their apostle. They thought he was too far from the law. You know, I may not be an apostle unto others, particularly the Jews, but without doubt I am to you. For the certainty of that, the seal of that, the evidence of that is that you're in the Lord and you're in the Lord because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, you can say it's because of Paul. I've had several people tell me that. You know, so-and-so led them to Christ and a lot of people feel that way. But actually, the Holy Spirit led them to Christ through somebody. Okay? <clears throat> Nobody folks, by preaching, can lead anybody to Christ. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. My answer, and this is Paul's answer, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that, that God is having Paul write my answer. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Well, well why is anybody examining him? The word answer there is... is uh, is our English word apology. It's where we get our word apologetics. I'm not exactly sure why it's, it's called apologetics. That's a, that's a technical uh, argument for truth. My apology to them, and the word answer is, is, is better, but my defense would be a perfectly good translation, I think. And, uh, and apologetic is, is a defense. My defense to them that examined me is this. So apparently the Holy Spirit wants us to know that, that there were Christians who were questioning Paul's credentials. Now that shouldn't be too surprising to us. Happens every day. Still happens today. There are an awful lot of people who hate the word foreknowledge. You know, that those who love God love Him because they were foreknown by God. Dearly beloved, I think it's wonderful that God foreknew me. I think it's absolutely comforting to know that He is the one who foreknew me before the world began. My defense to those who apparently want to examine me is this. Don't we have the power to eat and drink? And now we're back to the same subject of the last chapter. And the answer has to be, of course, he has the power. He has the authority to eat and drink. But he had just said he won't do it as long as the world stands if it causes my brother, to stumble. Now, what does he mean by stumble? Well, moving against their conscience. Easiest thing in the world to do is say, you know, well, that's a silly conscience. I mean, you know, uh, anybody that thinks it's wrong to eat meat offered unto my, which is nothing, you know, some human made it, you know, stone, wood, clay, you know, whatever it is. It's nothing. Man made it. If man made it, it's surely not better than man. It's something beneath man. You know, that's a crazy conviction of conscience 
why don't we spend our time trying to educate this poor soul so you know so he doesn't you know so he doesn't have that conscious guilt sinning against the conscience of those Gentile believers their conscience said they didn't need to be circumcised they didn't need to keep the law and Peter came down and said, well, you know, no, you do, you do. You. So why didn't in Galatians, why didn't the Holy Spirit tell Paul, hey, you know, you know Peter's a dear brother, so let's not offend Peter. The guy with a, a strong conscience is the one that gives way to the one with the weak conscience. Okay? Not the guy with a strong conscience ought to beat up on the guy with a weak conscience, you know, and say, you know, look, you, you got a lot to learn. You got to learn and you got to grow up. I mean, grow up. Come on. You know, our text is saying that the strong gives place to the weak, and that seems to be in agreement with Galatians chapter 6. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness not well you know he ought to know better you know this guy he just you know you know he ought to know better i don't do that but you know it seems the text says if you were where he was you would you know there are doctrinal issues and there are convictions but i would in no way say to somebody whose conscience says you know, you, you've got to be water baptized in order to go to heaven. You know, and I mean, you know, whether, whether it's forward or backwards or, you know, once or twice or, you know. I'd never give in to that. I think drunkenness is wrong and God clearly says don't get drunk. But nobody, nobody, folks, can build a biblical defense that you can't have a glass of wine or a beer or whatever. But that seems to shock people. Something... There are Christians, I've known Christians, many of them, who think that, you know, Sunday, well, you know, shouldn't be for anything but the Lord. It's just a, a day that's totally dedicated to the Lord. That's all you do. You read the Bible, you pray, you witness, you spend the day for the Lord, while others think that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon after church on Sunday, you know, you can ride, you're going to go riding horses or you're going to go to the movies or you're going to go to the lake or you can have a barbecue or whatever, and that seems to infuriate some people. Should we as believers defer to that weak Christian's conscience and not play, you know, softball after church on Sunday? I don't know. If I, if I have a brother in Christ who I think is absolutely foolish, I still believe I ought to love him consider him and deal gently with him before the Lord now when it becomes doctrinal well no I don't I don't know that seems to me that's different if someone said if you eat meat offered to idols you're gonna go to hell that's not it's totally different okay if they say it's wrong to eat meat offered to idols and I think it's okay it's not that big a deal I don't care whether I eat the meat or not not important to me if someone thinks it's wrong to go to movies I don't think they ought to go to movies. You know, Romans 14 has the same discussion. Blessed is he, I pointed this out, in, I think, in the, in the last video. Blessed is the man whose heart does not condemn him in that which he allows. That's, that is a wonderful verse. I believe that word hard is what we're calling conscience here. He is not condemned in that which he allows. So I, I do not believe that the context is doctrinal. You know, folk, folks, I'd never take you to an idol's temple and, and invite you to eat. But if you think that by your eating meat that you're going to hell, now you and I are going to have a theological discussion. So it looks to me like, you know, these are personal convictions not doctrinal considerations. It deals with personal convictions. And I think it's a wonderful thing to walk through life and your heart doesn't condemn you in those things which you allow.
do we not have power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And the answer has to be yes. Now, but why is the question there? You know, the word power is a, a word for authority. Don't we have the authority to do that? Well, sure, we do. We have authority to eat. We have authority to drink. So we don't have to give it up. Verse 13 of chapter 8. We have more than that. We have a lot of authority as apostles, as those who are serving the Lord. We have the power to lead about a sister or a wife. Now, that's, that's not talking about marriage. Uh, but, uh, you know... In our work for the Lord, we can have a wife go along with her expenses paid. I mean, other brethren do that. Cephas, you know, he had a mother-in-law. Don't we have power to forbear working so that the church will bear our expenses? And the answer to that has to be yes. And it's, it's clearly illustrated uh, by by whoever would go to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and, and, uh, and doesn't expect to eat, you know, of it, of the increase, you know, who cares for his flock and feeds it and doesn't, doesn't uh, expect to eat from the milk and the meat of, of the flock. It's clearly obvious that that's the anticipation. However, I think it goes beyond the text to suggest that the authority to expect that uh, church members are obligated, you know, as if under law, to support the ministry. You know, pastors, missionaries, you know, they shouldn't insist upon it. They shouldn't demand it. You know, it, ha it has to do with conscience, liberty, love, grace, not law. I can't find any place in the Scriptures where any minister of the Gospel is, is to demand support, insist upon support. I mean, uh, the only place I do see it occasionally mentioned is really is on TV. I don't see that in God's Word. I'm not opposed to offerings. I know that the Lord's going to provide. In the Old Testament, the Levites, they didn't go around drumming up funds. I mean, you know, you can, or writing books, you know, you, you can just see the big sign on the tabernacle there. You know, next week we've got a revival meeting and we're going to have a, a fundraiser. Gotta, we've got to repair one of the badger skins or something. I, I, I know that Christianity was not meant to be a product industry. That I do know. There were free will offerings, and the tribe of Levi were supported by those. They were supported by those gifts and offerings that the other tribes willingly made to the tabernacle. And I believe that that's, I believe that's the way the church has always been run. And one who pastors a church can expect to be fed and to be supported by that church. But apparently, Paul didn't. The suggestion is normally made, well, you know, Paul really didn't pastor a church. He traveled around a lot. And, and you couldn't say that he actually was the pastor of any one church. I think we're splitting hairs there. Uh, although he was in Corinth for about 18 months. So there are those who argue that Paul uh, did not feel, even though the church might have been responsible for his expenses, since he wasn't actually the one that stayed there, and, and taught and ministered uh, uh, to those dear folks that he, he didn't do that permanently, that he, he should be paid. And so he worked. He worked. However, the cl clearly the text says that he had the liberty not to do that if he wanted to. Okay? And the inference of the text seems to say that if he hadn't worked, God would have provided through the church. I hope as we've gone through this that you've seen a series of examples that, that, that they all seem to have a single common denominator here. Just because we have certain rights or liberties under grace, it is never beneficial to ourselves or to others 
to, to defend or to insist upon our own right to those freedoms, okay, at the risk of what it may cost others. Dearly beloved, we are told what our obligation is in Romans 8.12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, law, to live according to it. The love we saw in our text, the love of God, it's the love of God that builds us up. If you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, hello, and commanding to abstain from meats, hello, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving because it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer note the words marriage and meats there in that in that passage just what we've been looking at here dearly beloved there are rights and obligations associated with marriage, union, okay, intimacy, separation, and our bearing offspring, producing fruit, that sort of thing. That is the begetting of children or, or even preaching, all of that or none of that. Okay? The means whereby we are able to work, we were we were bought with a price, we are not to be servants of one another, but of God. We are to be content with where our sovereign God has placed us at any given time because all of these things are temporal, folks. They're temporal. I think we're to understand that Christian liberty doesn't define or dictate our relationship with God or one another. We have a right to many things, okay? But the exercise of those rights may not always be in the best interest of our brother, our brother or sister in Christ, or ourselves, under grace. Our primary interest should not be on our entitlements, what we think that we deserve, what's owed us, or on what we, you know, we think is, is others should do. You know, do we have power to eat and to drink or not? Or, It shouldn't be on what we think we're entitled to as free men in Christ. We are not under law but grace. We are looking at Christian conscience under grace. We are looking beyond our own conscience to the conscience of others. Christianity is not a contest between Christians. Okay, It is not a dividing of the body between brilliance and ignorance and and uh, the faithful and the unfaithful, the smart and the dumb, the you know, you strong people over to the right, you weak people over to the left, and you know, it's love is what motivates us, folks. Not our love for one another as much as God's love toward us. That's what builds us up. How can we, who are so loved by God unconditionally, allow our relationships with one another to be governed by something else? governed by conditions imposed upon one another, expectations of one another. What have we been given by God that our weaker brother hasn't also received? Amazing how that you know one Christian will look at another Christian or one group of Christians will look at another group of Christians and they'll classify and they'll put them in a category of you know, they'll judge them outwardly, usually by appearances and, and all that. Folks, we are the body of Christ. I think we ought to start acting like it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.